I've got all that out of the way. Uh, I want to get to our, our uh, part two of our series. We started last week. Uh, we started a series titled, Christmas is Personal. Uh, and we're exploring the reasons why Christmas is <clears throat> and should be personal. And listen, I know a, a bunch of us, we can probably, everybody in this room can come up with all kinds of reasons as to why we believe Christmas is personal. Let, let me ask you this. Does anybody have a Christmas ornament hanging on your tree uh, that's um, very personal to you? Anybody in the room got a Christmas ornament? Okay. Anybody in the room have a Christmas ornament that you hang on your tree and you've got more than one that's personal? Anybody? Okay, there's a few of you. Anybody got more than five that are hanging on your tree that are really personal, have a personal meaning to you? There you go. Boy, there's a few less hands. The rest of you, now I know why the Lord wanted me to do this series. The rest of you don't take Christmas personal, apparently. <clears throat> we actually have two trees, okay? Mama wanted a foo-foo tree. That's what we call it. It's a foo-foo tree. It's all, you know, you're decorated up and all, all frizzy and all fraily and all this kind of stuff all over it, you know. And, and then she's actually added, made it a little warmer. You know, it's got a, a few personal Christmas ornaments on it. Um, but then when my kids were smaller, they revolted against the all white light foo-foo tree. They wanted a good old redneck country Christmas tree. So <clears throat> Kristen came up with the idea because we, we didn't want to go buy another fake tree. So on our back porch, our covered porch, we put up a live tree every year. We go to Food Line. Food Line's got the best trees and the best prices, all right? Don't go uptown and spend $150 on a tree that you can get a Food Line for $35, okay? Just letting you know right now. We buy it from Food Line every year. <clears throat> and they got nice tree. We got a seven and a half foot tree this year, and it's $35, okay? So there you go. But anyway, um, we get that, and it's covered in ornaments they made as children, in things that we might have done, uh, in pictures that were taken from school. It's, it's the whole tree is covered. We've even got the ornament on it that says, Our First Christmas. Uh, we, were, we were out to this, this weekend, Tracy and I, we were out going for a couple of days uh, down to Beaufort where we like to go, and we were looking at ornaments and things like that. And Jean, for whatever reason, she, she only had the Christmas spirit if we were eating at Amos Mosquitoes. Other than that, she didn't have the Christmas spirit because I was looking at ornaments, and she was like, yeah, 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 how about this one? Well, I was looking for one that says our 23rd Christmas. They don't, they don't make those for some reason. <clears throat> so I figured I'd have to make one up myself. But everybody's got a Christmas tree, and you've got some ornaments. You may not have an ornament that's personal. You might actually have a Christmas decoration somewhere in the house that's personal to you. Everybody can come up with all kinds of reasons as why Christmas is so personal. But I've centered on four reasons that no matter the year, <laughs> even say in 2020, no matter the year, these four things will always help you remember how personal Christmas is supposed to be, <clears throat> how personal you should take Christmas, even with all the commercialization, even with all the stuff that, that, that goes on. There are four reasons why you have to make sure you're aware that you're embracing Christmas personally. And the first one we talked about last week, which was challenges, challenges that you face in the week and day up leading up to Christmas, challenges that you face. It's interesting that Christmas is at the end of the year, <clears throat> and you're able to look back. That makes Christmas very special, that I can look back, and with all the challenges, remember what we said the definition of challenges was uh, presented with difficulties. And I asked you last week, has anybody had any difficulties this year? You faced any difficulties at all? Anything at all that has made this year difficult, okay? What if I said, let's do away with the virus and then ask, have you still faced any difficulties this year? Absolutely, right? We've all had those. And last week we talked about the fact that challenges can make Christmas very personal, very personal. And we went through what all that meant. And, and, and we even talked about 
some of the challenges that Joseph and Mary faced last week. We talked a little bit about that. And, and, and we're going to talk a little bit more about that today. But a lot of times, challenges can be such a challenge. Challenges can be so difficult that they actually lead to changes. Right? They actually lead to changes. If, if you just look at the most obvious thing we're facing right now with all of the health crisis and, and, and the COVID thing, and, and you look at how it has changed the way we do life. <clears throat> it, has, it has changed the way. Matter of fact, we have a friend who is in the uh, uh, buffet food business. And, and they've said that months ago, months ago, before it got like this, it's like within two or three months after COVID really hit, that they were already being instructed from the headquarters that none of those restaurants would be allowed to be to be uh, to maintain buffet style. It's going to change their industry. I don't know what Chick-fil-A is up to, but apparently they've decided they can make more money with drive through than they can sitting inside. While everybody else is sitting inside. I don't understand it. But I am impressed with the fact that just like yesterday, I pulled in. She said, I ain't getting in that line. We had, had, I drove down later. She'd been down there all week. So I drove down later, so we were two different cars. And I said, well, I want to eat lunch at Chick-fil-A. It was 1.30. And Chick-fil-A looked like 12.01. Y'all know what I'm talking about. And, and she looked over there, and it was right at the corner of a stoplight, kind of like what we got, and a mall. And everybody was compacted right there, and it was two. She goes, mm-mm, no, I'm not eating. I'm not, I'm not, get, uh-uh, mm-mm. I said, all right, well, I'm going to get in there. Well, I timed it, believe it or not. Of course he did. From the time I was able to get out of the mall parking lot and into the uh, Chick-fil-A parking lot to the time I put my first French fry in my mouth, it was 12 minutes. It's pretty impressive, okay? That's 12 minutes with a double line. But they figured this thing out. It's changed the way they're doing it. Now, I hope they opened up some point. I did, it's all rumor, all rumor, all rumor. Say it again, it's all rumor. But I did ask a kid at the Goldsboro one uh, that we know, and I said, man, I haven't seen you in a while. When are they going to open up? He said, well, I don't know. Last thing I heard people talk about was April, and this was a month ago. I said, you mean I can't sit my honey in that place until April? I said, nope, don't look like it. What's happening? Challenges can be around for so long that it creates change. Changes the way you deal with things. Changes the way you work through things. And Christmas is personal because of changes that happen in life. Now, like I said, it's interesting that Christmas is at the end of the year and you're able to reflect back and look back in the last 10 months and 11 months and you go... Forget 2020, go back to 2019 when everything was so hunky-dory. But you can still look at the challenges you faced and you can look at some of the changes that were created in your life and, 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 you, and you reflect back and go, hey, it's interesting how, you remember, we didn't think we could ever survive that change. And all of a sudden you look back 10 or 11 months and go, I'm still here. As the old gospel song says, I'm still standing. But by the grace of God, I'm still standing. Uh, and, and, and we look back because we, we face changes and we go, it's impossible. There's no way. There's no way. There's no, there's no way I'll ever be able to handle that change. And yet you look back and, wow, you were, you sold yourself short, right? <clears throat> Why? Why is that? Why are we fearful of the change, and then at the same time, we find ourselves months down the road that we've gotten through it. Well, part of that is because of what I tried to tell you last week, and I'm going to remind you of it again this week, and that is simply is that just like challenges, we cannot uh, separate the positive changes from the negative changes. They are bonded together in life to form powerful life stories of deep 
and personal triumph of faith and deep and personal triumph uh, uh, of hope and of love. You can't separate them. One of the, one of the greatest testimonies, and, and I ju it just popped into my head. I can't even remember their names now. Uh, I'm going to try to remember their names. They were country artists. Uh, Joy, uh, who, Roy. Rory, that's it. And, and what was the husband and wife? Rory and who? Joey. And you remember she went through cancer and she passed away. Young couple. And in the interview that he made, I screenshot it. I didn't, I didn't bring it with me. But, but the interview he made, they asked him about his faith. And they said, you, you and your wife talked about faith in this. And you talked about it. I didn't like the way the interviewer did it. But this is the way the world does it. The interviewer said, you talked about faith as if it was going to heal her. Where are you now? And he simply said, you cannot only thank God for the good things he brings in your life and then complain to him over the bad things that happen in your life. You have to have your faith in him, whether it's good or bad. And I thought, there you go, brother. You stand strong in that. Because why? Because what he's really saying is you can't separate good things from bad things. They are bonded together in this life because of, in case you don't know it, sin. Sin has shattered the mirror that is supposed to reflect wholly the full life that God had for us. But God made a way that you could still see through the fractured mirror, through the dysfunction of life, and see the grace and hope and triumph with the good and the bad. Mary and Joseph faced those changes as well. You can find it in Matthew chapter 1 and Luke chapter 2. You can find the story. Uh, but throw one of my maps up there, if you will. I want to show you some of the changes and, and give you a little insight here into what happened, okay? Now, so here's what happens. Jesus, uh, they find out they're going to be expecting when they're here in Nazareth, okay? And, and what happens is there is a census. Do you remember that? Like we take a census. Well, the governor of that day, the, the ruler of that day, uh, they did a census based on patriarchs. In other words, based on males, okay, is what they did the census of. And so when the decree went out from Augustus that every man had to go back to his home in order to uh, be counted in the census, so they're expecting here, and it's right near the time. It's about eight months into it, okay? It's about eight months into it. And... <laughs> Picture this now. I want you to try to picture this. And, and so she's eight months pregnant, all right? She's within at least eight months pregnant. And the census goes out that you've got to return to your home, and she has to get in her nice uh, uh, suburban with heated seats and drive all the way back down. No. Okay? What we would call a four-cylinder, they had a four-legged horse, a donkey. She had eight months pregnant. Now, I've seen some of you pregnant ladies walk in here and say that these chairs are not comfortable because of the condition you're in, okay? I understand. To ride on the back of a donkey all the way there or to walk. Where would she have to go? She had to go from Nazareth, and they went down here to Bethlehem because that's where he was from, okay? While in Bethlehem, Jesus is born. And eight days after Jesus is born, they take him to Jerusalem because by Jewish law, he is circumcised and he is blessed and dedicated to the Lord. <clears throat> and so there, and they leave, it's only about seven miles from Bethlehem to Jerusalem is only about seven miles. So they leave Jerusalem after that and they go back to Bethlehem. While in Bethlehem is when, and they're there a while, is when Joseph has the dream that he's not to return to Nazareth, but he's to flee. So he flees to Egypt, okay? So he takes his newborn baby and his wife, and they go to Egypt. Anybody know what he had to, why he had to flee? What was happening? Herod. Herod had been tricked by the wise men, and he didn't, they didn't tell him where the baby was. So he decided, well, I'll, I'll try to get him this way. I'll, have, I'll give an order that every male child two years young, old and younger is to be killed. 
and that did happen. <clears throat> and so they're down here. And after a while of being in Egypt, he's by, told by another dream that he can go back. So he goes back along this. Throw the other map up there. Okay? Here's another look at it. <clears throat> See, this is Egypt, the country of Egypt, and uh, Israel. And over here you got Syria and and Iran, and, and uh, Saudi Arabia. And so you see, he starts out, he goes down here, goes along the sea, goes down into deep into Egypt, and comes back along the sea, and goes up there. Throw the other one up there, because you're going to see this. Most scholars give you two, two routes. One says that he came down across, by, by the Jordan River and went into Bethlehem. The other route says that he actually just took a straight shot straight through here. Now, I'm just going to play with this for a second. There's two reasons why I don't give a lot of credit to, or belief to this one, that he actually came straight down, and, 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 the other, and, and why he actually went by this. You see that river? Okay? And if you remember, the last map had them all down here by the, by the river and all up here by the water and back up there. Well, first of all, remember, Jews hated who? Samaritans. This is all Samaria. Go back a map. I'm going to test Zadok. You see how this is? This is Samaria. But he comes through on the outskirts by the river to get here, and then he goes down, and he comes back on the outskirts there. Okay? I don't think he went straight down through. I think he did. He took a man's directions. He didn't follow his wife's directions. He just got a straight shot. He took the roundabout way there. But why am I showing you all of this? Because... From the time she says, I'm pregnant, to the time they get back to Nazareth is almost 15 months. Almost 15 months. They faced 15 months of challenges in that time. Heck, they even faced the, 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 the law that said, we're coming to kill your child. <clears throat> They faced all of those challenges in over 12 to 15 months. But here's what's interesting. Go back to the first map, Zadok. Here's what's interesting. Do y'all remember the challenges I talked about last week? You remember? Teenage girl telling mom and daddy, I'm pregnant. Mom and daddy not happy. <clears throat> the, the, the custom of the time is they could be stoned. So they basically flee for their lives. They flee out of shame. Well, here's the interesting thing. So they left Nazareth and did all of this. 12 to 15 to 18 months later, they've moved back to Nazareth. I thought mom and dad were unhappy. I thought his mom and dad were unhappy. I thought that they were ashamed of them. I thought that <clears throat> the, the, the religious culture of the day said she had to be stoned to death. What's happened? Challenges created changes. I mean, think about something. <clears throat> Mom and dad would be very, would be very uh, embarrassed in the, in the society of that day, would be very embarrassed, would be very shamed. Uh, the, the Mary as a young teenage girl and him as a young man would be, would be shamed. But when they come back, there's some changes. One, they're married. Two, they have a baby. Baby changes everything. Don't it, grandparents? Listen now, you hear them? There's a few of them there. Baby changes everything, right? <clears throat> there you go, see? Babies change everything all the time. Now, see, to a mama and a daddy, that might be like, oh, gosh, shh, shh. But a grandparent's like, pinch them again. You know, grandparents just want all that. Kind of. I always have been told that the greatest thing about being a grandparent is that you can sugar them up and send them away. See? Listen to all the grandparents. <clears throat> the greatest thing is this is, how they, this is how they get us back one day, Tracy. This is how they get us back one day. They're going to bring them to us, and, and, and you know, this is how we get them back. And all of the aggravation and all of the hair loss that I've had. So, you know I had a head full of hair like Elvis Presley until I had kids. Okay? And by the way, it's still coming out, John Kazar. It's still coming out. You, you understand, right? He understands. Still coming out. So here's the deal. <clears throat> we're going to get their kids one day, and we're going to sugar them up. I'm just going to give them the whole bottle of molasses syrup and whatever. Just say, here, just 
Just look, here. It's honey. It brightens your eyes. Okay? I know you're not but two. If you need to wash that honey down, here's a Mountain Dew. Okay? Wash it down. <clears throat> and, and then we're going to look at Riley. Riley's like, don't you dare. Let we're going to send them back to their mamas. Right? That's how we're going to do. <clears throat> That's how we're going to do it. That's the greatest thing about grandparents. One of the things, one of the things that I've heard. What happened to Mary and Joseph? Challenges created changes. <clears throat> but not only that, while they're in Jerusalem, they run into an old man in his 90s and an old woman in her 80s, both who have lived in the presence of God and are prophets, and they give the prophecies of who this Jesus is supposed to be. And Mary and Joseph hear these prophecies, and suddenly it really dawns on them even more, and it creates change <clears throat> in their lives. Changes are going to come to all of us <clears throat> each and every day. Each and every day. And a lot of times they come out of the challenges we face. <clears throat> but no matter the changes, I ought to be able to understand Christmas. I ought to be able to keep Christmas. They went through personal changes. Joseph and Mary were now responsible for someone else, not just themselves. Think about the changes we're facing today. Think about all the things that we're facing, not just personally, but in the way we do school, in the way school has had to be done, in the way uh, we're doing our ministry, in the ways that we're having to meet needs, in the ways that you're having to go to work, many of you from home, facing the challenges and there's just a few things I want to kind of be Captain Obvious about. I'm not going to give you anything that's new that you don't already know, but let's just, let's just highlight them for, for just a couple of minutes. Change is one of the most constant actions in life. It's always hilarious how church people particularly, but I'm sure there's a lot of other types of people uh, at work and business or whatever, but church people particularly don't want anything about their church to change. They'll fight over it. <clears throat> they'll split up families over it. They'll, they'll, they'll sink the church into bankruptcy over it. Come on. Because they don't want nothing in their church to change. They want it all to stay the same. And here's what they're really saying. The closeness and, and the way I found God and the way I interacted with God and the way I experienced God, here's what you're really saying is I don't want us to lose that. And we think that the way we do church is what created that experience with God. When, when we were years ago <clears throat> at Crossroads and we had had to rent downtown buildings. So we were in downtown Pikeville and we rented three buildings uh, to have church in. One for little kids and one for the, for the children's church. I mean, one for the nursery, one for the children's church and one for everybody else. And, 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 and that building, uh, it, it seems like that, that, that building probably wasn't much wider, wide, probably about this long probably wasn't much wider than our lobby. Enough to have a row of 10 chairs over here, about 10 rows of them, one aisle, and 10 rows of chairs of 10 over here. And we were in the process of building a, our first church building, at Crossroads. And Pastor John got up and was talking about it, and, and the church was packed. We were having people standing around in that little old building. Men were told when guests come in and when ladies come in, give your seat up. And it got to the place that there was a couple of Sundays where we actually opened the door and there were just men standing outside. Okay? And, and here's what was said. <clears throat> Pastor John got up in, in the pulpit and he said this. He said, I've had a lot of people tell me this. A lot of people tell me that they're worried about moving to that new facility that's going to be similar to what Pikeville Church was. Uh, if you were to ever go to Crossroads, it's about like this. And, and and, and he said, I've had a lot of people tell me, we don't want to lose what we've got here when we move to a bigger building with more space and more room. Pastor John, we're really, and it really began to build a little bit of anxiety and, and, and not wanting to move, not being excited about the church building. And here's what he said, I can guarantee you we will not lose 
what we have now, even though we're going to face a lot of changes, if you'll do this one thing. If you'll keep in mind that the reason you can go through changes and still have what you feel is that what you feel isn't from this building. What you feel is from the presence of God. And if you will keep the presence alive, it won't matter how wide and big and deep the building is. Come on, church. <clears throat> and they faced that. Why? Because change is one of the most constant actions in life. And we try to ignore it. And change can be both heartfelt and heart-wrenching. Change can be heartfelt. Let's just say uh, in one family, I, I know of sto multiple stories, but where in one family in a 12-month period of time, they celebrated the birth of a grandbaby. Heartwarming. And they also had the heart-wrenching deal of burying a grandparent. All in the same 12 months. Change can be heartfelt, heartwarming, and heart-wrenching in the same time frame. Are you still with me? Change is voluntary, okay, and involuntary, okay? <clears throat> when my nephews, they were all, they were all here uh, for Thanksgiving, and I got a nephew uh, who is uh, just joined the Marines. He goes in January. Uh, if you knew my nephew, you'd understand why I went, whoa. Um, and, and so he has got hair. I'm telling you, he's got hair. And everybody around the table was talking about how beautiful his hair was. Oh, long locks of hair, you know. And I'm like, see, I understand involuntary haircut. Okay? I have never understood why guys with big, beautiful hair shave it off. Okay? Now, he's got to. He's going in the military. But when y'all come in, some of these guys, they got big, beautiful hair. They had, and I'm like, you know, and then they come in, they look like skint cats out in the farm somewhere. I'm like, what in the world have you done to all that hair? You see, if it's involuntary, I understand it. But voluntary? No way. Why? Because change is voluntary and involuntary, isn't it? There are things that we look to change, and there are things... They don't. Change creates obstacles, right? How are we going to figure this out? That's the obstacle. But you can focus on the fact that change creates obstacles, or you can focus on the fact of let me be challenged to find the opportunity in this change. Listen, I am a, I am a vanilla ice, cone, ice cream cone. You hear me? My crowd goes, Dairy Queen, and they want to get all this kind of dee -dee 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 in it, you know, and then sprinkles and all this other junk in it. I'm like, you're ruining the taste of ice cream when you do all that. Every now and then I'll get the mini blizzard, but I, I like just vanilla ice cream. And they look at me like, I've got the plague. Like, you're just eating vanilla ice cream? I mean, that's boring. No, it's not. It's good. Okay? I like it that way. But here's the thing. Here's the thing. I can look at the opportunities in it. You have to look at what are the opportunities that you face in this challenge. What, what's going on? What are you facing? What are you dealing with? Are you going to look at it that way? They look at vanilla ice cream as just, ugh. And I go, no. I see it differently. How do you see your challenges? How do you see your changes? Are they just simply obstacles? Here's why I'm a vanilla, just plain vanilla guy. There is a certain way, I'm 54 years old, there is a certain way that in my philosophy of ministry, there's a certain way I want to do ministry. I know it, it's inside and out, but 2020 has been an upside down event for me in how to do ministry. <clears throat> There have been days and weeks where I've said, how are we going to do this? How are we going to do that? I don't know how we do this. How do we do that? How do we? And there have been times where I wanted to be like other people and just say, well, you know what? It's such a big obstacle, and I don't know how to, how to, how to get it right. And I just don't like to have to do it that way. I want to do it the way I want to do it. And since I can't do it the way I want to do it, and since it's such a big obstacle, let's do what some other people do and let's just not have church. 
Let's just bury our head and say, I'm not have church. Isn't that how we do obstacles sometimes? We don't want to deal with it. We don't want to face it. So we try to tune it out. We bury our head in the sand. Or it's not the way I want to do it, so we're not going to do it at all. Isn't that what we do? But can we begin to see our changes for opportunities rather than obstacles? Can we do that? Oh, I got to run. I got four minutes or so, something like that. Listen to me. Change creates a dynamic that allows us to experience something new or different while at the same time remembering and reflecting on how important something used to be. Can I just tell you something to tell everybody else? I don't want to see the day that you're all sitting at home because you no longer find an interest in coming to church and you're just reflecting on something that used to be important. I don't want us to see Christmas as just something commercialized and because our kids are, are, are grown and gone or, or because you're just older and you don't hear the bell anymore in Polar Express. I still hear the bell. I'm 54. I took, we took pictures. We took pictures. Uh, and by the way, you're banned from letting anybody see that picture. But we took pictures at the, at the beach. You know, one of them cutouts, one of them cutouts. And I stuck my head in one of those cutouts and I said, send it to the girls. And do you know what my 17-year-old daughter had the nerve to respond back with? Y'all are such children. <laughs> I'm like, if you can't be fun at 54, be a dried-up prune. Would you rather be sitting with a prune or, or, or somebody who's fun? Yeah, I'm both, by the way, according to my girls. Listen. Change creates a dynamic where you experience something new, but you also reflect on the importance. Change reminds us of what is constant. Are you with me? But here's why Christmas is so personal about changes that you face. There's one thing even more constant than change. Jesus. Come on now. Miss Louise, I'm not going to dare ask you how old you are, but you have told me before, and there may even be somebody in this room who is a little older than her. I don't know. I, 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 don't, I don't think so. I'm not sure. But you've seen a lot of challenges in your life. You've seen a lot of changes in your life. And I would believe as good and as heart-wrenching as a lot of those challenges and a lot of those changes were, you're here today because you believe more than all of that that Jesus is more constant than any change or any challenge you've ever faced. When I, that, I don't just assume that old people go to church because there's nothing else for them to do. I had a young and not my young. I had a young and said that to me one day. I don't want to get old. I was a youth pastor. I don't want to get old because old people ain't got nothing to do but go to church. What up? When I see people in those later years in life continuing to walk through the doors of a church, rain or shine, sore or hurting, it's a testament. It's an inspiration to me. And they're saying. No matter the challenges I've faced in 80, 90, 100 years, no matter the changes, the good ones and the bad ones, the thing more constant than change has been Jesus. Matthew 28, 18. Listen to this. Jesus is talking. Jesus is talking. Let me give you the setup real quick. He's been, he's been crucified. He's raised from the dead. He's been on the earth 40 days. They're all standing at the foot of the mountain, and he's standing, and he is about to, right in front of their eyes, go into the clouds. And they're all, 120 plus people witness it. And this is what he says to them as he's leaving. And Jesus came near to them and said, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit 
teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. He said this to them at the beginning of a major change for all of them. He was about to leave them. He just spent three years with them. They've, been, they've watched him in the physical presence and seen what he's done. And he's about to leave them. And yet he tells them, but I'm going to still be with you in spirit. And they were going to face major changes in how they lived their lives and major changes in how they did ministry. And he said that to them. Why is it so important to me and you? Why is it so important to me that you truly embrace the main point behind the title of this series? Christmas is personal. Why is it so important to me? Why has this been resonating in my heart since July? Well, so that the main point of this whole series doesn't get lost in translation to you and you wonder in two more weeks, now what was the purpose of that series? I decided, even though I got two more weeks, which Pastor Jordan's going to talk to us next week about Christmas is special or personal because of children. Maybe it ought to be Riley <laughs> with all them little children. But I've asked him to speak about children and Christmas. And I'm going to be here to hear the message that God's putting in his heart. And then we're going to come back on the 20th, and I'm going to talk to you in an obvious way, but more obvious than you may know, that Christmas is personal because of Christ. And that's going to wrap it up. But I, it dawned on me that I didn't want to wait four weeks for you to get it. The reason why God stirred this in me. The reason why it's important that you embrace Christmas and you take Christmas personal every year, regardless of the challenges, regardless of the changes, in all the ways you take Christmas personal. It was as if God was saying, Mark, there's going to come a time in people's lives when they're not going to think that Christmas has any significance at all. They don't even care about it. They don't even know why. They're not even caring about the commercialization of it. They're just totally humbugging. There's going to come. They need to know when your children come to you and say, what's the meaning of this? You have to have lived it so much that you can tell them. So back in July and in August, and in September, when I was studying and putting notes together for this, when I felt that urge to go to, that, that need to go to Jordan, said, I need you to speak into this. I was asking the Lord the question. Okay, Lord, I know the obvious. But is there a hammer? Is there an exclamation point? Is there some one singular truth that, that you're wanting me to make sure people know why they should defy all challenges and changes that tell you that Christmas is not personal and is not important and you should never worry about it again. Is there one reason? Is there something burning in you that you're wanting me to capture and I've not captured it? What is it? And in July, he didn't give it to me. And I asked that again in August. And in August, he didn't give it to me. And I asked that again in September. In September, he didn't give it to me. And I asked it again in October. In October, he didn't give it to me. And I asked him again in November, and it was Thanksgiving Day when he gave it to me. I was sitting at the table eating. And knowing all that we're going through, all the circumstances we're going through in this life right now, and looking around at the individual's of my family who were there and the others that were not able to be there. And God spoke it. And I got up and I went and I wrote it down for I would, so I wouldn't forget it. And it took him till November before he said, now is the time that I want to tell you. And it was simply this. This is the main point. 
of the whole series that we're going to be doing. And I didn't want to wait four weeks to tell you. We must all celebrate Christmas. No matter what happens in life, we must take Christmas personal. And this is important because there is no Easter without Christmas. There is no hope without faith. Without hope and without faith, we face our challenges defeated. We handle change with simple grief. What do you mean, Pastor? I mean, whatever changes we go through, we handle it with grief. The grief that simply says, I'm hurt over what I've lost, not what I have. And there are many, many people who won't give God the chance, who won't give Christ the chance because they're so hurt over all the losses in life that they can't focus on what they have. On what they have. Mark, there is no Easter without Christmas. There is no hope without Christmas. There is no, there is no faith without Christmas. And without hope and without faith, you face your challenges, your difficulties already defeated. You'll never get through them. You face your changes with nothing but grief over what you've lost. Our children live life with no eternal awareness and no eternal value. In Christ, well, he's only a historical figure. There's no value to him other than the fact that he was a good man. Without faith, without hope in Christ, without faith, without hope in Christmas, nothing in life has any value. Christmas is personal because it reminds us of all that truly matters in all the challenges we face and in all the changes we go through. Anybody in the house? Stand with me. So, believe it or not, those of you close to me really know this to be true, but over the years, some of my best points in messages, some of my messages have actually come from commercials. They know it. On the day that I die, if I still have the phone I've got, which is very likely, because I don't like to keep upgrading, and they, I don't like change. Matter of fact, when they start threatening me to upgrade, I start threatening them to go back to a flip phone. No, then we can't have your locations. I said, I know. So, on my phone, there's, in the notes section, there's just a bunch of little sayings. There's thousands of them, hundreds of them. And a lot of it comes from different things. That I know my spirit, and I know how the spirit of the Lord goes, hey. And when he does that to me, I immediately write it down, type it up, whatever. I've told Tracy about my funeral. I said, and by the way, my funeral's already planned. What? Because she plans everybody's funerals. And I said, on my phone, there's my list of music, and in my desk, there's some sticky notes, and it's got my funeral message or, or, or scripture reference. She's like, you need to give me all of that so I can put it together. I said, nah, you'll just have fun going through everything when I'm gone. It's my one last way to aggravate her. She just got to go hunting for it all. But there's a commercial out right now. There's a commercial out right now by Walmart, of all people. And the first time I saw it, I was in the kitchen, and it was just on the TV, and I heard it before I saw it. And immediately when I heard it, it went right into my spirit because I thought about Christmas. And if you ever find it, it's got a good old song to it, but if you ever find it, basically here's the nuts and bolts of it. It simply says this, what we needed changed this year. 
But what's truly essential didn't change at all. Let's end the year with what truly matters. And in a spiritual sense, that couldn't be more true. What you thought you needed in 2020 may have changed. What challenges you have faced this year, what changes you have gone through may have led to a change in what you needed from moment to moment. Did anybody ever think they were going to need 180 rolls of toilet paper piled up in your closet in January? Nope. Did any of you ever think there would be people who would actually start making a profit off making masks? Nope. What you needed changed. But what is truly essential, what is truly priority, has never changed. And if you started the year with Jesus as the priority, then you need to end the year with Jesus as the priority. Because Christmas, after all, is very personal. Why else would God use the backdrop of Christmas to bring in the birth of our salvation? Any other time of the year. He could have done it in hot July. No? No? He chose a time and a place to make a change in all the world of what's essential. And there are a lot of things that are important that we need, but there is nothing more essential than you making sure that you always celebrate Christmas, no matter the, no matter the grief you're in, no matter what you're the weight you're carrying, or no matter what the joy you have spewing out of you, no matter what the situation is, you should always make Christmas personal because God did. He made you personal at Christmas. Bow your heads. Lord, we love you. I pray that if there's one in this room today, Lord, who doesn't know you personally, right now where they're standing, Right now where they are, all they have to know is that the Lord loves them and forgives them of their sin. And you welcome them into the family by faith. Holy Spirit, reach out to that one right now if there's one here. Lord, in all the challenges and changes we faced in 2020, like no other year in many of our lives, I pray that you continue to help us keep not only Christmas personal, but our personal relationship with you strong. We thank you for all the ways that you've been a blessing and all the ways that you are the blessing in our lives. I pray, Heavenly Father, that those that are here and those that are not able to be here, that you minister this truth right into their very hearts, right into the very core of their being. And may we keep essential what you have kept essential, and that is a relationship with you. We love you. We thank you for it. And in the name of Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Y'all see how religiously disrespectful my crowd is? Right here in church while I'm praying. Y'all need to pray for their salvation. Okay? Because they're going to know what hell feels like from this point on the rest of the day. Y'all are dismissed.